Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. My wife realized the value of our marriage, but it was too late. Today we have a story with a similar plot. Enjoy the show! Travis Wesley had the worst day of his life. Not every day does your young and attractive wife, only 23 years old, announce that from this evening she will start dating other men. Travis sat silently behind the kitchen table, clutching a glass of monkey shoulder whiskey. For 10 minutes, he didn't touch the amber liquid. He just sat there, staring straight ahead, not seeing, not hearing, but feeling immense pain inside. Travis knew that not even Aka Seltzer could relieve him of this pain. He had heard stories of other men's wives confessing to them that they were dating other men, but he always considered it nothing more than an urban legend. How could a woman assume that her loving husband would agree to such a thing? Travis simply couldn't believe that a woman could be so indifferent to her husband, so blatantly selfish in her desires. Of course, this happened on a Monday, but it was a good day at his company. He even left the office a few minutes after five, whistling a cheerful tune. Returning home, he still felt quite upbeat until he discovered his wife sitting at the kitchen table, pouring herself a glass of red wine. With a glass and bottle of his favorite whiskey in front of her, he dropped his briefcase, poured himself a glass, and then sat down on a chair. What's the secret, Lauren? Travis asked, noticing the sly smile on his wife's face. His wife looked him straight in the eyes and smirked. What he saw in her eyes made him feel uneasy. He nervously grimaced. Do you think I've been a good wife and mother all these years? She asked calmly. Travis furrowed his brow. He knew his wife understood that he was a thoughtful person, and she could practically see the wheels turning in his head before he answered, Yes, I think so. And what are you trying to say with that? He asked, maintaining his composure. Several seconds passed as Travis carefully considered his response. Do you think I should be rewarded for fulfilling my duties as a good husband and father? He asked. What kind of question is that, Travis? Lauren snapped irritably. Today, I want to go on a date with another man, she said, calm as a lake on a beautiful morning. Travis was glad he was sitting down. He felt bile rise in his stomach. His thoughts were akin to a wiped clean slate, utterly empty. A date? With another man? He managed to say, struggling. Lauren looked at her husband as if he were a stupid child and nodded slowly. Yes, with another man, Trav. I haven't been on a date with another man since you and I became exclusive 24 years ago. I have been a good wife to you, a good mother to your children, and I deserve a night with another man, a chance to try someone new, not someone to love, just pleasure. I'm 47, and I can't stay beautiful forever. I want to try more men while I'm still a desirable woman and can have them with the snap of my fingers. Travis's lower jaw slowly dropped. He knew that he had understood his wife correctly, but of course, she couldn't be serious, could she? He didn't even have to ask the question. Laura nodded at him as if reading his thoughts. Damn, he muttered, as she stood up from the table and headed up the stairs to the bedroom to change clothes. Walking downstairs, Lauren looked stunning in a little black dress that practically clung to her gorgeous body. In front, it had a cutout to the middle of her chest, and in length, it barely reached the middle of her thigh. The makeup was light. A beautiful woman doesn't need much, and her long blonde hair was pulled back into a high ponytail. The spectacle was amazing. Lauren saw that at this moment, her husband was completely hers. Then I won't let this happen, Lauren. Travis said, standing up from the table. I don't know what you're thinking and what you're doing, but you won't do this while remaining my wife. Lauren's bright smile turned into an ugly grin. You won't ruin this evening for me, Trav. You can speak harshly, but you know that you will not divorce me because of this. Where will you find a woman like me if you let me leave? Nowhere, and you know it. And the children will be angry with you for destroying our family. Suck it up, Travis. Let me have fun for a few years, and then it will be just you and me again, and we will grow old together. You know you love me. You don't want to be left alone for the rest of your life while I have men to choose from. The sound of a car horn sounded, Lauren grabbed a small bag and walked over to Travis, trying to kiss him goodbye. Her husband shuddered as if from a slight shock and pulled away to the side. Lauren looked surprised and hurt for a moment, 
then her expression turned to anger. I'll be back home. I don't know when, she said, leaving. He watched in horror as she walked out the door. Could his 23-year marriage be over? It looks like, he thought. Lauren didn't even look back at him as she walked out the door. Scientists have established a sad but true fact. People with good looks have an advantage in life over their more ordinary peers. They make friends more easily, receive more attention, and teachers are more inclined to give them better grades. In Lauren's case it worked that way and only got worse. When she turned 13 and her chest fully developed she quickly learned that if she batted, her eyes and smiled she could get almost any boy she wanted and for those boys who were playing hard to get she simply puffed. Straightening her chest a little, the deal was sealed. Like virtually every boy she came into contact with, Travis fell under Lauren's spell almost from the first time he met her. His family moved to the city the summer before he entered 8th grade. He met Lauren on the first day of school and was quickly captivated. Travis was a good athlete and popular with other students. Eventually, he plucked up the courage to ask Lauren out on a high school date, and she accepted. They became a couple and lasted until the first weeks of their junior year at the local high school when Lauren dumped the young man in favor of Landon Estes Jr., who was a starter on the school's football team. At that moment, Travis stood at a height of 1.63 meters and weighed 50 kilograms while Estes was 1.88 meters tall and 86 kilograms. Although his feelings were hurt, Travis accepted his fate. He knew Lauren was out of his league in terms of looks. Heck, most of the boys at school weren't in Lauren's league when it came to looks because she was dating a football player. She hung out with the popular kids at school. Travis was one of the faceless minions roaming the hallways. He dated and became friends with selected students but did not communicate with Lauren. Sometimes during his school years, he noted that the few times she came face to face with him, she acted as if he were a complete stranger. The first time it happened he was angry but then he learned to accept it by his. Senior year Travis had grown 23 centimeters and gained 18 kilograms he was a handsome and athletic young man but he was far from Lauren. Of course few were like that. He came to the prom with his attractive but not spectacular girlfriend that evening they gave each other their untouchable. Lauren was the prom queen and her date was the prom king they also had a night after graduation but before this event she was far from untouchable sometimes. She was manipulated sometimes she was manipulated into him was always on the menu for any guy lucky enough to date Lauren. After high school, Travis attended Michigan State University to study accounting. During his four years of study, he dated several girls, but he did not have any serious romances. Lauren attended Central Michigan University and majored in marketing. She dated and slept with many men during her college years, including a marketing professor when she needed to turn A-B into an A. After years of being the object of desire, Lauren had become very skilled at the game. By pure coincidence, they both got jobs in Grand Rapids after graduating from college. About a year after graduating from university, Travis and several of his work colleagues were enjoying a Friday night at a popular bar and restaurant when Lauren walked in with two women. All heads immediately turned to look at the striking woman in the short green dress with a low neckline. Lauren barely paid any attention to it because, at that moment, it was expected, and she was used to it. Who is this goddess? Steve White croaked to the entire table of colleagues. Without having time to think about his words, Travis reflexively replied, This, ladies and gentlemen, is Lauren, the goddess, and your humble servant's eighth grade girlfriend. Every head at the table turned from the woman to Travis, many of them with their mouths open. Have you met her? One of them asked incredulously. Travis winced in displeasure. He hated drawing attention to himself, any attention. I was about 14 when we reached senior high school. I was covered with a copper basin, and she ignored me all four years as if I were the invisible man, he said quietly. So, do you at least have a good story about groping one of the women at the table? Joked one of the team members. The whole team burst into cheerful laughter. This made Lauren and her friends look at each other for a moment. She thought she recognized one of the men at the table, but she wasn't sure. The trio sat down at a nearby table, with Lauren facing the table of the man she considered familiar. Dude, aren't you going to come over and say hi? White asked. Jesus, Steve, you're drooling. Very unimpressive, said the first interviewer, 
Casey Jello. She pretended not to know me for four years. I don't understand why she would remember me now, Travis said. Several heads nodded in agreement. Lauren continued to study the man, enjoying her food. Then she snapped her fingers and pointed at the man. It's not good, Lauren, one of her friends said. If you point at someone in a restaurant, you might get hurt. In some places. She completely ignored her friend's remark. I'll be right back, she announced. I need to say hello to an old friend. Lauren practically jumped out of her chair and walked over to the table where Travis was sitting. Trav, hello. Very glad to see you. Lauren exclaimed, approaching him. Travis rolled his eyes at his friends and then turned to face his former classmate with a fake happy expression. Lauren, it's good to see you, Travis said almost without emotion, rising to his feet. Lauren entered Travis's personal space and kissed him tenderly on the lips, placing her hands on his shoulders. His colleagues sat stunned. Travis, in turn, was also stunned. Lauren realized this and smiled at him with a not entirely innocent smile. She felt very comfortable playing this game and she knew that he could not do it. Let's go to our table. I'll introduce you to the girls, she said. She took his hand and practically dragged him with her to her table. He spent most of the evening with Lauren and her two friends. Before he left, Lauren took his cell phone, entered her own number into it, and wrote down his number for herself. Lauren was more than intrigued that Travis seemed to be indifferent to her. This had never happened to her before. He was polite in the restaurant but spent as much time talking with her two friends as he did with her during the evening. She kissed him on the lips several times, but he never kissed back. On Monday morning, Travis's work colleagues at the bar confronted him about his relationship with the goddess and were stunned when he told them he stayed at the bar for about an hour before heading home. She's impressive, but she's 14 levels above me, I understand, he grumbled. I don't need such grief. Such distress awaited Travis in the parking lot at his workplace two days later when he was leaving work. He grumbled to himself as he saw her waiting for him by the car, although he had to admit that in a dress one size too small, she looked like Intim on a stick. Why didn't you call, Trav? She asked in a quiet voice as he approached her. Travis tried his best not to widen his eyes as he looked Lauren up and down, like a hungry man seeing his first meal in weeks. The low-cut top was unbuttoned all the way down to her cleavage, and the hem ended just about five centimeters below her crotch. Damn it, he muttered to himself. As she leaned forward to wrap her arms around his neck and press a kiss to his lips, he found himself defenseless. As her tongue slid into his mouth like a snake and attacked him, he, throwing his briefcase, and the kiss dragged on indefinitely. Several of his colleagues, who had stopped in shock, quickly got into their cars and drove away. They went to a restaurant located some distance from the city center and ate happily, although Lauren spent most of the lunch tugging at the bottom of her dress. Both Travis and the young waitress seemed to be enjoying her struggle. Travis was wary of Lauren, but he was only a man, and when a scantily clad goddess turned on her charm, he was toast. The best he could hope for was to perform well in bed that night. Oh my god, Travis whispered to himself, looking at Lauren without clothes for the first time. This woman was the goddess Travis had always imagined her to be. If this was going to be his only opportunity to give it his all, he had to be sure that he wouldn't miss his serve because lust would take over his feelings. Having had their fill, they lay face to face and looked into each other's eyes. Lauren smiled lecherously. Apparently, I screwed up big time a few years ago, she whispered. You have amazing abilities, who would have thought? If only I had known, we've lost several years, Trav. Lauren knew what was happening when it was right in front of her. Although Travis wasn't in her league in looks, he was still handsome, fit, and by the looks of it, had a good career ahead of him. He's also very good in bed, she thought, though she said nothing. Despite the fact that Travis had doubts about this woman, mainly related to her self-esteem, their relationship gradually improved. Her beauty was obvious, but he slowly fell in love with who Lauren was. I bought an engagement ring, but before proposing, they sat down and discussed their thoughts on fidelity. She had impressed him so far, but Travis wanted nothing left unsaid between them. Obviously, I don't know much about your past. I'm not going to ask about numbers or names, 
Travis said when they sat down at the table for a serious conversation. What happened in the past will remain in the past. The same goes for me. But I need to know about the future. From now on, I want us to be exclusive, fully. No ifs, ands, or buts. If you don't believe you can do this for us, I need to know now. He placed a small black box on the table between them. Lauren looked straight into Travis's eyes, then back at the box. I will never cheat on my husband. Never, Travis remembered these words. Apparently, his wife did not consider this cheating since she warned him in advance. He knew that wasn't true. She expected, hoped that he would take it that way, because if he didn't, he didn't accept it. Travis knew that Lauren had had many opportunities to cheat over the years, and as far as he could tell, she had rejected all of them, like a good wife should. She was a 10, hell, a 12, and he considered himself a 6 at best. This left plenty of room for someone closer to her physical level to sneak into the house and make a statement. Assuming that she did not have an affair that he did not know about, then she lived for 23 years as a real wife. Travis knew he should be grateful for these years, but he wasn't. When he said, I love you, he wanted it to be forever and not a measly 23 years. In fact, not a week went by without Lauren receiving proposals from someone, not just men. She knew that she was not just beautiful, she was amazing, a rare goddess among simply beautiful women. When God created his wife, he had an exceptional day, Travis always said. At first, Lauren told Travis about it every time she was hit on, trying to be completely transparent. However, after a few years, Travis said that he trusted her enough that she didn't need to tell him everything. The only time he would want to know that she was being pestered is if the pest did not accept her first refusal, then he would take the necessary steps to send the offender away. Travis, on the other hand, was rarely approached by women. This was partly due to the fact that he used his wedding ring almost as a shield. Within minutes of meeting a woman, Travis spoke in glowing terms about his wife and children, which usually extinguished sparks that might have flared. He didn't even realize what he was doing, and most women shut down before they even had a chance to flirt. Lauren had no idea that her husband was turning off potential flirts or worse. The almost fairy tale marriage lasted 22 years before Rosa Esposito entered the proverbial Garden of Eden, or rather, came to work at the same public relations firm as Lauren. In the words of a Bob Seeger song, she was a dark-haired beauty with big brown eyes and big chest. Men were attracted like a strong magnet attracts metal. In any other office, she would have been an alpha female, but at Super Solutions, she became, at best, a faithful assistant to the hottest woman on the planet. 42-year-old Rose had been married for 15 years, but according to her own words, she was not a fan of it. She had several affairs with her husband's knowledge and several more without his knowledge, and she often shared stories of her adventures with Lauren. She was a very good storyteller, and in her stories, intimate with most of her lovers seemed fantastic. So, you haven't tried anyone since you got married? You're just a rock woman? But I don't believe that you don't want this, Rose said one day at work during a coffee break. Well, I'm not saying I'm not curious, but I would never cheat on Travis, Lauren said. In recent months, Lauren had noticed that she didn't feel like she got as much attention from men in bars and restaurants as she used to. More than once, she noticed that the looks that were previously directed at her were received by younger women, and she began to doubt her abilities to visually attract, let alone play the what-if game. What if hubby lets you try? What then? asked Rose. Lauren's face showed that she had never thought about such a scenario before. The wheels in her head were spinning madly. I guess if I had permission, then it would be a completely different story, Lauren admitted with a mischievous grin. Have you ever thought about asking permission? asked Rose. You know that everything worth having is worth asking. Lauren had never thought about this before. Her face lit up, then went dark. He will never give me permission. Never, Lauren said. Should I do everything for you? asked Rose. Unspoken permission, tell him, and then take what you want regardless of his answer. Tell him that he loves you enough to let you do this, that you can get through this because it has nothing to do with love, that you love only him. Travis was awakened by the sound of a car approaching the house. Looking at his watch, he realized that it was a little after three o'clock in the morning. 
a glance at the bottle of Woodford Reserve showed that he had finished about half of it. Great evening, huh? He quipped to Lauren as she walked through the front door. Travis looked closely at the cliché his wife had become. Her hair was combed but tousled, her makeup was missing, her clothes looked rumpled. She didn't look remorseful but smug. I could say the same to you, she hissed. You didn't have to wait, you know. I am going to sleep, and you may be, but never again in this life with you, he snapped back. Lauren gave him a look of disgust and headed up the stairs. Travis poured three more fingers of bourbon into his glass and went back to watching ESPN. He spent the night in his folding chair, half sitting, half lying, his stomach grumbling. Around nine o'clock, he finally got up from his chair and made himself breakfast. While eating, he heard the shower turn on in the master bathroom. Under normal circumstances, Travis might have expected his wife to come downstairs in a robe and with her hair wrapped in a towel. This morning, she didn't come down for about an hour, and when she did, her hair was dried, she was dressed, and made up, looking impeccable as always. He expected nothing less. Did you happen to leave me something to eat? She asked. I made a big pot of coffee, but cooked the food yourself. And since you're dressed at home, I think now is the time to talk, he said categorically. Lauren was surprised by how emotionless Travis seemed. She expected him to simply foam at the mouth and be irrational, which would make him easier to manipulate. Rational Travis would make the conversation much more difficult, she reasoned to herself. Don't you want to know about last night? She said quietly. Travis detected a note of superiority in her tone. Does she really believe he wants to know about how he was cuckolded? Hardly. I want to know how you see our marriage moving forward, Travis said, his voice sounding no louder than hers. As I said yesterday, I intend to try several other men over the course of several years. Only intim, no love. I only love you, but I want to try a few more men while I still have the looks and the body. I gave everything to you for 23 years, and I never had a thought about betrayal. I want the thrill of something unfamiliar. You're wonderful in bed, but I want some variety. Well, you know, have some other experience for a while, and then you and I will go off into the sunset together. And I will be grateful to you for this experience and will spoil you exclusively for the rest of our days, Lauren said. Travis listened intently as Lauren spoke while preparing toast and jam for his coffee. He thought the way she buttered her toast while talking about the most important things in his life was rather dispassionate. He had so many questions. Is it all because you want variety? Am I not enough for you? He asked, creaking. She started to answer, but he interrupted her. So, you want to live in an open marriage for a few years and then return to monogamy again sometime in the future? Does this mean I can date others too? Lauren tried unsuccessfully to suppress her giggles. The idea of her sweet, quiet husband asking another woman out on a date was simply laughable. Travis was the most serious about marriage of any man she had ever met. However, if this is what it takes for him to agree in principle, yes, she answered. Of course, I assume that for you, it will also be just intim. Travis raised his eyebrows and shrugged. Lauren had no idea what this movement meant, however, she had an idea. So, would you like to go on a date with Rose? You know, a very nice woman from my office? I'm sure she'll be happy to agree, Lauren said, knowing that her friend would have no problem having a night with her husband. Especially if it meant helping Lauren achieve her goal of having intimate with other men and still being married. Travis looked puzzled. The lustful 21-year-old bachelor in him wanted to get Rose. The responsible 47-year-old married guy knew that he could not do this. I would be glad to have a date with Rose, but no. Baby, thank you. That will make me as much of a traitor as you were last night, he said. Lauren's face, which had started to smile, suddenly turned into a grimace of anger. I am not a traitor, she screamed. Well, if you insist, baby, he said much more seriously than she could have expected, but I still don't agree to it. Well, come to your senses, baby, because I will do this even if you don't, she snorted. On Monday morning, at about 11 o'clock, Rose came into Lauren's office and saw that she did not look happy. To hell with this bigot and the horse he came on, Lauren hissed, closing the office door behind Rose. Damn it, he even refused to date you, Rose frowned. I didn't know I was on the menu, but to hell with it. 
How could he refuse this? She said, stroking her body with her hands. How about a date? Did you have a good time, or did Travis ruin everything? Asked Rose. The date was fantastic. Jonas definitely knows how to make a woman feel good, Lauren enthused. God, it's been so long since I felt another man. I definitely like the difference. Who do you think I should try next? They both laughed heartily. Lauren was encouraged by the fact that she was not immediately served with divorce papers. Since she and her husband had virtually no contact, she decided it would be wiser not to ask about his plans at all. Although he didn't tell his wife, Travis really didn't want to rush into a divorce. I hope that she would quickly come to her senses and abandon her stupid plans to cuckold him. He believed that he could forgive her and they could forget about her misdeed if she stopped this nonsense. His hopes were boosted when Lauren didn't go on a date the following week, although he still didn't return to the bedroom, and they still weren't communicating positively. However, the following Friday evening, Lauren was again dressed to the highest standards, apparently ready for a date. Are you seriously planning to do this again with the same guy or want to use someone else this week? Travis asked sharply. Damn Trav, didn't you hear a word I said? It's not about you, it's about me and my desire to get something before I get too old to attract anyone. It's not that I want you less, I just want more indifferent. You know, people constantly pester me, I just want to enjoy it. I will always come back to you, she said. What if I don't want you to come back to me? I won't share with you. I won't sit idly by while you have fun. I'm not made for this. I won't wait until you try half the male population of our city. When you had your first date, I wasn't sure yet, but I think I could survive it once. It could be extreme stupidity, but twice, it is extreme disrespect, extreme betrayal. Stay outside all night, party all night, we're done. This is not why I was created on this earth, he said, his voice trembling. Wah, W, W, she said, making speaking movements with the fingers of her right hand. You don't want to lose me. It doesn't have to be an either-or situation, he said. Last week, Travis instructed his lawyer to prepare all the necessary documents, hoping that they would not be necessary. He planned to call his wife on Monday morning, but first, he needed to call his two daughters and tell them about it. Neither 21-year-old Jackie nor 19-year-old Michelle believed their father when he called them that evening. At least outwardly. But after talking with both, he discovered that his eldest daughter may not have just guessed that something was wrong. So, you knew she was going to create this nightmare, and you didn't tell me, he shouted over the phone. You don't think I deserve to know what is going to happen? Please, Daddy, I found myself in a very difficult situation. One of you would not be happy with me one way or another, no matter what I did. Besides, it's her body, it doesn't belong to you. And if she wants to share it, stop, do not continue, Travis shouted. I understand that she put you between us, but don't tell me that she can do whatever she wants whenever she wants because this body is hers. We took vows, the oath, abolishes speech about her body, he continued. I understand, but... She muttered briefly, and then fell silent. Damn, baby, I'm sorry, daddy, she whispered. When Lauren walked through the door at two o'clock in the morning, Travis was nowhere to be seen. Even though she arrived an hour earlier than her previous date, she looked a little more shabby. Gabriel Esposito was a large, strong man with great physical strength, perhaps the strongest Lauren had ever encountered in bed. By the end of the evening, she could hardly move. She knew that by tomorrow, she would most likely have a couple of bruises from his grip. Overall, it was a great night, she thought. She could enjoy Gabriel another time. Lauren was shocked and embarrassed when she was handed divorce papers at her office on Monday morning. She burst into tears and ran to the ladies' room. A few minutes later, hearing the noise, Rose appeared. You should have known that he would at least give you the documents, Rose said. You really hurt him, baby. This is his way of hurting you back, an eye for an eye. Men are such children. He's trying to get you to force things. He won't give up his 23-year marriage and half his belongings. Give him a week to be alone, and he'll come crawling back, she said, trying to comfort her. Straightening up, Lauren returned to her desk, picked up her phone, and immediately dialed her husband's number. How could you do this to me, in the office, 
in front of everyone. I know you're hurting, but I deserve better, Trav, she practically screamed into the phone. After 23 years, don't I deserve something better than you unilaterally deciding to open our marriage? If I'm not right for you, couldn't you have just warned me in advance, and we could have parted ways like civilized people? Travis said. I don't want civility. I don't want to get a divorce. I still love you, you still love me, she wailed. I still love you, but every time you have a night with someone else, that love diminishes, he growled. My love is not a bottomless well like yours. I always thought this was true, who knows, maybe we were both wrong. Lauren fought for a divorce, her lawyer requested and received marriage counseling, although Travis was adamantly opposed. Lauren smiled, and Travis frowned as they were ushered into the consultant's inner sanctum and found Lillian Kamak sitting in one of the chairs at the consultant's desk. Data on marriage counselors shows that most believe their job is to reconcile divorcing couples. And female counselors seem to be biased in favor of women, the consultant began. Let's start with correcting the errors. Let's start with the simplest thing, Mrs. Wesley. Did you really tell your husband that you were going to date other men for a few years? Travis tried his best to prevent the consultant from seeing his smirk. Lauren tried her best not to let the consultant see how shocked she was. She thought about lying but then realized that she did not have a ready-made legend for this lie. Yes, yes, I told him about it, she answered quietly. That's what I want. I don't need him to do for me. This won't affect our marriage. Well, I think we'll end here, said the consultant. Sorry to waste your time, Mrs. Wesley. I'll talk to the judge and end this farce. But, 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 Lauren began to stutter. Honey, if you thought for even a minute that what you did to your husband would work with me, then you are crazy. You should be ashamed of yourself, but obviously, you don't have an ounce of shame. Frankly, you disgust me, Miss Kamiko said. Over the next month, Lauren called and texted Travis several times a day as he rented a small apartment near his home. He did not answer calls or text messages. Then she turned to their daughters for help, who called several times. Dad, you know you still love her. If she stopped dating other men, would you give her another chance? Michelle asked during one of these calls. So she still continues to do this even after I served her? Travis asked in a trembling voice. He received only silence in response. That was all the answer he needed. Michelle didn't call again and didn't ask him to try again. Travis was surprised by how quickly word of his impending divorce spread, especially among single women. Several women at his work expressed their condolences over his marital problems, as did several women who were friends of both him and his wife. He was smart enough to realize that not all of their condolences were altruistic. Connie Mong, his wife's longtime friend, called to express her regret about what was going on in Travis's life. She almost directly offered him a shoulder to cry on, and not just a shoulder. Travis was shocked that his wife's close friend was hitting on him so openly. In all the years of acquaintance, the divorced woman never even cast a sidelong glance at him. I would never pursue a friend's husband. It's just wrong, she told him. But now that you are a free man, the rules are different. I'm letting you know that I'm interested in you. Shocked? I'm flattered but I'm not a free man yet, Connie, and I won't date until the divorce is final. I know I'm being stupid, but I won't cheat, Travis said. You're such a boy scout, Trav. This is one of the things I like about you. I always liked it. Can you at least set me up on a date when free? Connie asked. Of course, Travis said, but I don't want to come between you and Lauren. You've been friends for many years. I appreciate your sensitivity, but just because it's stupid doesn't mean I should miss out on a good person. I wouldn't even think twice if you were just some guy I didn't know when we just met, Connie said. Maybe I'll call you when I take off the leash, Travis joked. Connie was an Asian beauty, five feet tall, with a toned body and waist-length black hair, which was one of the main assets in Travis's eyes. He admitted to himself that he was more than surprised that the woman showed interest in him. Travis was true to his word and called Connie the day his divorce became official. On Saturday evening, they went to a restaurant and then to a local jazz club. Connie noticed that Travis was feeling awkward and commented on it. I feel like an inexperienced 15-year-old, he replied. 
I haven't been on a date with another woman in over 26 years. Don't tell me the protection in your wallet is the same one you had on your last date before Lauren, she joked. Should I have had a protection? Crap, I didn't even think about it. Well, I'm a noob, Travis replied. At the end of the evening, Connie kissed Travis tenderly on the lips. They both felt good after the date, and he promised to call again. Travis didn't think much about taking off his wedding ring on the day the divorce was final, but apparently, it was a big deal for unmarried women. Noticing the emptiness on his ring finger, several female employees took notice and commented on it, and suddenly the level of flirting in his office increased noticeably. This was new to him, and one day over lunch, he told his best friend at the office about it. There are a lot of beautiful women in this office. How did I not notice this before? Travis asked. You, my friend, were just a terrible henpecked man, said Robert Ardito. You were so deeply in love with this woman that you didn't even look at other women as intimate beings. I mean, she is a beautiful woman, no doubt, but you let her put your courage in her purse, and maybe that was part of the problem. She is constantly being tested, it has value, and you are so trained. Such a vibration emanated from you that not a single woman even looked at you in the first month after the divorce. In the first month after the divorce, Travis went on four dates, two of them with Connie. He hadn't yet managed to sleep with any of the three women he dated, but that wasn't his goal. In the second month, he was just as in demand and slept with two women. Travis's daughters, who have been in contact with their mother more than their father in recent months, have heard her constantly assert that while she can have virtually any man with just a snap of her fingers, their father is an ordinary man in his 40s who finds it difficult to even find a mate, not to mention a permanent girlfriend. They began to feel sorry for their father, and one Saturday morning about two months after the divorce, they went to his apartment together unannounced. Travis was unhappy that he was woken up at 8.36, especially since he had entertained his companion until late the night before. Sonia, a busted 25-year-old girl, was the daughter of a friend of a friend who needed a reliable gentleman for her wedding celebration. The evening went so well that the couple decided to end it at Travis's apartment. At that moment, she was sleeping in his bed when he opened the door in a robe. What? he asked, throwing open the door and seeing the smiling faces of his daughters who were holding bags of bagels, smoked salmon, and cream cheese. Hello, father. Could your two beloved daughters come over for breakfast? Jackie said as the couple entered the house. Travis kissed them both on the cheek and led them to the kitchen table where they emptied the bags they had brought with them. They were just putting away the bagels when Sonia came out of the bedroom wearing one of Travis's white shirts, half-buttoned, and probably not wearing anything else. Sorry, I didn't know you were expecting guests, baby, Sonia said. Mom said that you were your own boss. No, no, Sonia, these are my daughters, Jackie and Michelle, he said, pointing to his daughters with the appropriate names. We went to have breakfast, bagel with salmon. Sonia giggled, causing her large chest to jiggle under her shirt. She brushed her thigh against Travis's arm and sank into the chair next to him. The four of them engaged in normal small talk for a while until Jackie asked if Travis had spoken to Lauren lately. He frowned for the first time in days. Until this moment, he had believed that it was almost impossible to get upset when being around Sonia, although she was a little hard for his 48-year-old body. I have to tell you, Dad. We thought you were already missing mom, Michelle said. We know that she misses you, but I thought that when I was gone, she would live her life to the fullest. I know that I was an anchor for her though she was hanging out with them too at a time in her old bed. Dad, Jackie exclaimed while Sonia giggled and Michelle frowned. She's not a lecher, you know. Really, think about this for a second. How many different guys has she had a night with since we broke up? And those that I knew about before I left? Both girls blushed and lowered their heads. Wow, if it's two guys a month for what, ten months? That's twenty different guys. With three guys a month, thirty for me. There are a lot of guys, said Sonia. If looks could kill, Travis's daughters would have Sonia in her grave in a matter of seconds. She was well aware of this fact. Hey, don't blame me if a woman can't keep her legs closed, Sonia said. Children, children, let's not ruin my good weekend, Travis said. Sorry, all three young women muttered at the same time. So, 
You are a couple? Jackie asked Sonia quietly. You don't look older than me. Your dad said that we are the same age. But don't worry. I'm not going to ever become your stepmother. We're just friends. He's a great guy. He was my date at the wedding reception last night, and he's kind of a hottie. Did I mention that he's also a great guy? Well, we have to agree that he's a great guy, although we know he can be a bit of a jerk from time to time, Jackie said. And yeah, he's kind of hot for a guy who's old enough to be your dad. It was Sonia's turn to blush. Travis blushed too. Hey, baby, remember that we have lunch with the newlyweds' families at the hotel at noon. I need to take a shower and grab some clothes from my apartment before we go, Sonia said. Both daughters rolled their eyes at their father. Mom, she's my age, Jackie told her mother over lunch a few weeks later, and it didn't look like a one-off. They spent quite a long time together. They enjoyed each other's company. I don't think he'll crawl to you soon, Mom. No, you just caught him on a lucky day. He was probably helping a friend's child and got lucky. She is probably a girl of easy virtue who will have intimate with anyone. Your dad is a great guy, but he's not a stud. Jackie, Jackie raised her eyebrows at her mother. You always seemed pleased with him until you told him you were going to leave him. Why didn't you just cheat on him without telling him? Wouldn't that be a lot easier? You might as well have the cake and eat it too. That would be cheating, Jackie, and if he caught me, well then we would break up. Having told him about this, I didn't cheat and was sure that he would give me what I wanted when he realized what exactly he would lose. I must admit I did not expect a divorce. I never thought he would have the guts to do it, Mom. I think you mistook love for weakness, and somewhere along the way, you decided that everything depended solely on you. Was it all worth it? For the first time, Lauren's face showed the stress of what she had to endure from Rose's lips. Everything sounded much better than it actually turned out to be. She couldn't tell her daughter that the intim was normal, but no, it wasn't worth it. She also couldn't tell her daughter that she never thought Travis would do anything other than sit around and pine for his beautiful ex-wife. She was so self-absorbed that she had no idea that a handsome, if not gorgeous, Man with great character, intelligence, and a solid job could be very attractive in the singles market, and not just for middle-aged women. She knew that after the divorce, her ex-husband dated several women, including her old friend Connie, and now with some young woman of easy virtue the same age as their eldest daughter. Instead of sitting at home and mourning his past life, he goes on dates like a single 20-year-old and gets more attention than he deserves. She didn't tell Connie when she found out her friend was dating her ex for the first time, figuring it was some kind of pity date, but the second date was completely unnecessary. And she told Connie privately in a rather loud tone, I thought we were friends, Connie. You should be on my side. We girls have to have each other's backs. But he didn't do anything wrong to you, Lauren, and he is a good guy, great. He is everything I want in a man. Why don't I date Trev? Hell, women are lining up to go on dates with him. He's prime AG beef on the hook, girl, and he's a great gentleman and great in bed too. I will go on a date with him anytime he invites me. How could you drive such a man away? Lauren silently stared at her friend with her mouth open. She was just beginning to realize that her mistake was growing by leaps and bounds. She loves Travis and hates coming back to an empty house at the end of the day. She hates sleeping alone at night. Travis, of course, could not have imagined that his life would become so exciting. He would be quite happy if his old boring life remained as it was, but other than that, life suited him quite well. Work is good, social life is great. He enjoys being with several women of different ages, and most of his dates end in bed. He's certainly not looking for a long-term partner at the moment, but he sure enjoyed the smorgasbord. There's more to life than just being married to a beautiful woman. Marla Goodling, shoulder-length silver hair streaked with purple in a ponytail, emerged from a hole in the back of her Chicago Go Cubs baseball cap. Her blue Cubs t-shirt hugged her ample chest, and her light blue Levi's clung to her figure. Despite being 60 years old, she drew more than her fair share of stares in the left field bleachers at Wrigley Field. One of the people looking at her appraisingly was the man she was with, Travis Wesley, the ex-husband of one of her longtime employees, Lauren Wesley. He and Travis attended a Cubs game as part of a weekend trip to Chicago. 
Marla had worked with Lauren Wesley for over 15 years. I met Travis at several corporate events where he accompanied his then-wife and always thought he was a handsome and pleasant guy, she thought to herself. She knew that she and Lauren had divorced about two years ago. Marla had been a widow for about five years. Her longtime husband had died in a car accident. During this time, she went on only one date, after which she decided to find out Travis's phone number. Yes, Travis remembered her. He thought it was hard to forget a woman who seemed to exude both style and beauty. He would like to go to dinner with her, absolutely, he replied. This was several months before this moment. The first date took place in an expensive restaurant, after which there was a concert at the Philharmonic, and tickets for the concert were provided by Marla. The evening ended with them kissing at the front door of her house. The second date was a Saturday hike on the trail, and the woman giggled several times when a clearly tired Travis had to take short breaks during the day. It appears she and her late husband were avid climbers and hikers, and although Travis thought he was in good shape, it turns out he was wrong. He also learned that Marla had a toned body for an older woman and mesmerizing gray eyes. The date ended with Marla and Travis making tender love on the rug in the living room of her home, after they had a steamy make-out session on the sofa. She intrigued him with her combination of wealthy class and girl-next-door freshness. Marla happily agreed when Travis suggested she spend the weekend sightseeing in Chicago as part of their third date. On their first date, Marla told Travis that she had no intention of telling Lauren that they were dating. If asked, she would not have denied it, but she was not going to advertise this fact. Marla also told Travis that Lauren told her co-workers that she and Travis were getting a divorce due to irreconcilable differences. Travis told Marla the same story he told everyone else. Lauren had cheated on him with at least two different men. He didn't elaborate further. In the two years since his divorce, Travis has developed several strong relationships and enjoyed what he considers an amazing intimate life. All of his partners had a good opinion of him, and some of them hoped that they would be considered when Travis decided to trust women again and get married. Lauren worked in a different direction. As she told her then-husband before their first date, she was simply looking for satisfaction while she still had the looks to attract almost any man. She was not looking for an emotional relationship like most of her partners. This major difference between the two ex-partners would be a problem for Jackie. She and her mother were deep in preparations for the upcoming wedding, which her father was happily paying for when Lauren told her daughter that she thought both parents should attend the wedding unaccompanied so there would be less tension. Jackie quickly agreed with this idea and conveyed it to her father that same week when they chatted over lunch. Does this brilliant idea come from you or from your mother? Travis asked sternly. I plan to bring a lady with me. I'm paying for this holiday, and I'm going to have a lot of fun with the one I bring. Hell, I've been taking dance lessons for about a year now, ever since you announced your engagement. Have you taken dance lessons seriously just for my wedding? This is so cute, but no buts. Jackie. She apparently doesn't have anyone she considers close enough to invite, so she's trying to put pressure on me, and again she acts like a selfish jerk and tries to manipulate the situation in her favor. Sorry, baby, but I won't be showing up to my daughter's wedding without a date. If you don't have the courage to tell her about it, then I certainly will. She can go alone or take a gentleman with her, that's her business. I'll bring the lady with me, Travis said. Got it, Dad. I will tell her. Your point is correct, and I really want to see you dance, but could you still bring someone older than me? I can do this, baby, but you really should watch how Sonia and I dance. Travis smiled widely and received a wide smile in response. Travis took Connie along with him to the wedding. Travis thinks she looks great in the sea green dress she bought, and he paid for. They quarreled because he bought this dress. Travis explained to the woman that since he was the father of the bride and would be wearing a tuxedo, she needed a new dress, which he would be happy to buy. And yes, I understand that it also requires shoes, he told her with a wide smile on his face. Walking his eldest daughter down the aisle was one of the greatest and worst experiences of Travis's life. All the other fathers who had told Travis it would happen had hit the mark, he noted to himself. Still, it was a wonderful day. He, Connie, and his children had fun and danced until late at night. The only moment that caused discord on this day was the appearance of his ex-wife with her own gentleman. Not that Travis cared, 
but the guy spent most of the first part of the wedding smirking at Travis. And then most of the second part staring and groping several women like an obnoxious drunk, at least until Jackie asked for her mother to remove the guest. Lauren, clearly embarrassed, apologized profusely and quickly ushered the man out the door before leaving with her date. Lauren still took the time to follow Connie into the women's restroom. You're the one who stole my man, she said to Connie when they were in the toilet. I'm sorry, but I've never stolen a man from anyone, Connie answered. He divorced you before we even started dating. You have no one to blame for this divorce but yourself. You threw away a great man for cheap night. Lauren's face turned purple, her eyes which had initially been staring intently at the other woman, suddenly dimmed. She lowered her head and stood motionless as Connie walked out the door. Connie never said a word to Travis or the family because she didn't want to ruin their special day. A few months after the wedding, Michelle visited her father and seemed restless. Travis watched her for a moment before asking the question, Okay, Mitch, what's going on? You've been kind of nervous all evening. Michelle blushed deeply and began to stutter. Travis knew something was very wrong. Ah, uh, Dad, you know, Mom talks about getting back together with you from time to time, about how she will win you over when she stops having intimate with other guys. Ah, uh, ah, uh, you two didn't have a night or anything, did you? She asked. My night life is none of your business, young lady, Travis snapped. But no, I didn't sleep with your mother. And what? Yes, the fact is that she has a venereal disease, Dad. I heard the end of her conversation with her friend, Rosa, and she said that she had syphilis, Michelle said quietly, without looking her father in the eyes. Travis looked surprised and then sad as Michelle watched him out of the corner of her eye. I guess you're telling me this because you're worried about me, Travis said. But it is standard state policy to tell all possible recipients of the disease that they need to be tested. I did not know that. I was just worried about you, Dad, she said. I know Mom is still sleeping around. Several of my friends warned me that she was quite promiscuous. It's always awkward when a friend tells you that your mom isn't perfect. A few days later, Travis received an unpleasant call from Mara. He immediately realized that she was worried about the same things as Michelle, although she obviously also had concerns about her own health. If you're wondering if I slept with my ex, the answer is not just no, but hell no, Travis said. Believe me, Mara, I understand your concern, but I can't help the fact that my ex is a scandal. The scandal is the nicest thing I've heard about her in a long time. In recent months, her activities outside the home have become the subject of gossip on the sidelines. It seems like the longer she's single, the more she loses her guard, Mara said. Lauren used her STD as a starting point in her plan to get Travis back. She was satisfied that she had had enough men to last her for the rest of her life. Six months after the doctor said she was cured, she began a plan to get Travis back. She was still slightly resentful of Travis for divorcing her the first time, which was not her original plan. This plan might have worked if other women had not started hunting Travis. Lauren had no doubt that she was a treasure. She didn't expect Travis to be as attracted to other women. I know he's a great guy but can't these women see that he's nowhere near my level of intimate? She said to Rose one day as both women sipped margaritas at the bar waiting their dates for the evening. Rose pushed her friend to her current lifestyle. She knew that Travis was quite handsome, but she greatly underestimated the depth of his personality. Also, because he always obeyed his wife, she expected Travis to just sit around and mope while his wife had fun with other men. Who knew that Travis had such an inner core? Lauren and Rose had been keeping an eye on Travis since Lauren gave him the ultimatum. And in truth, it turned out that his post-divorce life was almost as intense as Lauren's. If Lauren had been more honest with herself, she might have admitted that her ex-husband's intim life seemed to be much better from an emotional standpoint. Travis was more than surprised by the voice on the other end of the line. He hadn't spoken to his ex-wife for almost two years. One of his daughters must have given her his new cell phone number. He didn't forbid them to do this, but he said that he did not consider it necessary to ever speak to her directly again. Hi, Trev, she purred in her sweetest tone. I think it's time for us to talk. I thought we shouldn't talk until Mel got married, but since this is not yet the case, maybe we will return to silence again, Travis said, still the same Travis, still trying to deny that you love me. 
But you know what? You love me. You know you want me back, still the same Travis, she replied. You still think that everything revolves around you. Look, Trav, I know you're still mad at me, but I really love you. I probably should have just cheated on you and kept you in the dark, but that would have been cheating. It was still cheating, Lauren. Just because you told me you were going to do it doesn't make it any less real. You did it because you thought I would never give up on you. Do you think I'm that pathetic, Lauren? Travis said. I know you think you're a 10, hell, a 12, but more than that, you're gorgeous. I don't have to live in your shadow, as the last few years have shown me. I am not just the husband of a beautiful woman. Other women want what I have to offer and are willing to repay me emotionally. My last few years have been absolutely wonderful. Why would I want to date a selfish woman again who clearly doesn't respect me and, no matter what she says, doesn't love me the way I loved her? Loved her, in the past tense, after disconnecting, Travis put down the phone and turned to the woman next to him. Are you ready for the second round? He asked Sonia. Sonia eventually found her soulmate and married him. But Connie and Mara continued their relationship with Travis. He fell in love with both of them in his own way, but never married again. They also loved him in their own way, and both women accepted this relationship together. Moreover, a few years later, both were invited to attend the wedding of his second daughter Michelle with Travis. This did not please Lauren, who did not invite her boyfriend to the wedding. She complained to her daughter, but Michelle did not support her. After me, Jackie and her family, Connie and Mara are the two closest people in the world to Dad, Michelle answered. They love Dad for who he is and put him above their own selfish interests, which not everyone can say about themselves. He was yours, and you left him for more intimate. Why? Simply because she was afraid of getting old and thought that he had no other options, that he would never give up on you, not for anything and not for anyone. Travis was happy with his life, even if it wasn't his first choice. He left a situation that he considered unacceptable. Lauren's life was not one of loneliness and remorse. After all, she was still a beautiful woman, and beautiful women often just need to show up for men to start hitting on them. Lauren was often approached and had quite a few short-term relationships, however, none of them developed into anything long-term. Looking back, Lauren had to admit that she regretted telling her husband that she was going to leave him, only because she still couldn't come to terms with the fact that Travis had given up on her so easily. How could she have miscalculated so badly? She often wondered to herself. She was a 12 out of 10, but he was only a 6. It shouldn't have ended like this. How about today's story? I think the husband did absolutely the right thing in deciding that diversity after decades of marriage is not acceptable. Let me know what you think in the comments. See you in the comments.